Good day and welcome to the Strong Ambition Podcast. I'm your host, Ryland Qualley, and I'm here to dive into what makes people ambitious and live a more ambitious life. And I have a wonderful guest that will help you with this and change your whole perception on what that means to go after your ambition, go after your goals. As a matter of fact, she's not going to talk about creating goal setting. She's going to talk about patterns. Adele Spragon was someone to reach out to me about helping me reach out to my listeners about personal development. And so she has a fascinating story where we talked about how she came from trying to improve her own behaviors. She even had many startup companies. She wanted to be an entrepreneur and they, they didn't work out. And she was really trying to have a hard time. She couldn't figure out why using all these traditional models of setting goals and trying to tackle goals was not just working out for her. It just wouldn't work out. And then she went back into education and she understood more about the neurobiology and understood that it's more about patterns. And instead of thinking about What's, you know, is there something wrong with me? What am I doing? Why can't I achieve these goals? It's like, instead of asking what's wrong with you, it's more about what are you thinking about when you're trying to achieve something? It's more about your neurobiology rather than the whole function of where you're going after. And and we dive into this really well. So I don't want to butcher her explanation. She gives you some great strategies and we really discuss this idea on how you can actually optimize your lifestyle way better. So dive into this right away and you're going to learn something about behavior change in a whole new way. All right. Welcome, Adele. Great to see you today. How are you? I'm very good. How are you, Ryland? I'm pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. Awesome. So this is, uh, you know, the first time we met. I, I, I love uh, meeting new people, especially people like yourself that are so into this realm of personal development like myself. And so uh, why don't we dive into your story? This is where I really, I love new guests explaining where they come from, especially knowing, you know, how they evolved into their profession right from the get-go from being a kid into being curious into something and, and taking that where you are today. So why don't you tell everyone about yourself? Oh, wow. You want to go way back. Okay. Love to hear it all. Yeah. (laughs) Usually I don't start that far back, but all right. Well, I was, I, I actually grew up in Venezuela. So I was born in England. I was what is called a shell baby. So my father was in shell oil and we moved to Venezuela and lived there for much of my childhood and then moved here, um, into Canada, I should say. Um, So I was shaped very much by that experience way back when, but today I'm a behavioral change expert. So I, I'm an expert in people's behaviors and helping them to shift behaviors that don't work. I got into that primarily because much of my life, I was trying to work using mindset techniques and using all, I had a lot of therapy and a lot of uh, approaches such as that. And none of them really worked for me very well, Ryland. So what I did was I thought to myself after I had done this for 15 years and done all of this mindset and tried everything I could to reach my goals. And I was still quitting. I decided that it couldn't be us, that the problem had to be the operating instructions that most people are being provided. And so I went to university and I wanted to study how the human brain makes decisions, how the human brain thinks. And I came away knowing that our operating instructions are incorrect. And that had me create new operating instructions. And now I help people to achieve goals based on these new operating instructions, based on how our brain actually works. Well, that's fascinating. I, and I love that you came away with that problem solving, uh, you know, just realizing, you know, there's, there's gotta be something wrong with the instructions. And, and I find like everyone responds different to different instructions. You know, you'll hear someone walk away with a great case and you try those instructions yourself. It's like, Hey, it didn't work for me. And so, uh, what were the previous instructions or, you know, manual, if you will, that wasn't working for you. And then when you went to school, what, what kind of stuff were you looking into? Yeah, so we, we, we live primarily under a false premise, and it goes like this. Set a goal, and then once you know those steps that should take you to that goal, you ought to be able to take those steps. And if you don't, then you need to find somebody who knows how, and then just follow in those footsteps. If you're still not taking them, then this, frankly, typically how we're taught to see ourselves is there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong. So quit that goal. Start again 
create another goal and do it all over again. And I did this time and time and time and time again until eventually I said, hang on a minute. I have tried everything under the sun, everything from professional development to personal development, everything from positive thinking to better goal setting techniques um, to um, affirmations, which I would say every day, to kundalini yoga, which I would do every day, to meditation. I was a meditation facilitator at this point, thinking, okay, if I can just reduce my anxiety, then the, I should be able to take those steps. I did it all. And I still was not reaching my goals. And so that's when I thought, okay, maybe we've got this wrong. And sure enough, what, what's happening, Ryland, in, in um, neuroscience is fascinating in that we have to throw away all of our false beliefs about free will. Our brain is not actually making and giving us the ability to make choices, it is making choices on our behalf. We have built into our brain decision-making patterns that are predetermining the choices that we make. And inside those patterns, we have a very limited range of choices. And so what I found out was based on our brain's patterning, we have to remove the pattern that is making the wrong choice first before we can ever think to take a new action. And it's there that we're missing in the operating instructions. I like that a lot. Um, you're, you're getting into a great topic. One of my favorite, you know, philosophical topics of free will and people have a hard time swallowing that pill, but it was a huge eye opening uh, depiction for me. And, you know, we don't have to go all the way into determinism, but I have a deterministic view on things that, you know, you're, you're both nature versus nurture. You're both, but neither of those, did you get to decide, right? You're, you're both this genetic seed that you're predisposed to be and your environment and how the genetics are playing a part in your environment. And, and it's really fascinating to know you didn't decide either of those. And so at what point did you get to choose who you were? And so my whole thing on soft determinism versus hard determinism is what you were just exposing there is, okay, there is something there. If you look at the attention to detail of why you're doing this action and, and it, it's before you even know it, right? So this is kind of like you said, the, the, the neurobiology of this, of where is the decision made before the decision, right? And this is where people go into the subconscious mind and how many times do you deliberate a decision and you, you actually already knew it, but you didn't want to admit that, you know, it right. So when you went back to school, I'm, I'm assuming you then went into a bit of neurobiology or what, what was the field that you really studied? Actually, I didn't. I decided to study it from a multidisciplinary approach. So I took humanities because I wanted, I didn't want to be limited with just what psychology already knew. I didn't want to be limited by what science already knew. I wanted to really understand the human equation and how the whole part, all of us comes together, all, all parts of our brain come together to create our life and who we are or who we perceive ourselves to be. And so I was really grateful that I did that because it really freed me up to truly look at it from all sorts of different perspectives. And I was studying literature, philosophy, um, humanities and the sciences and psychology. And it allowed me to really take this broad open scope and, and rethink things from the very start. So just some of the things, I mean, you know, you talk about determinis determinism and that's absolutely true. But the thing that we need to know about our brain is that it is highly, highly adaptable and it is always trying to correct itself and correct its patterning. And that is, if we believe in a designer, that is the design of the brain. It is to constantly try and adapt and try and change. And that's why it makes human beings so brilliant and our ability to adapt is incredible. The thing is, we just have to know how to do that. We need a tool to do it. So it's happening today spontaneously. If we hit a situation in which our brain doesn't yet have a pattern, our brain will very, very quickly piece together a pattern, which will give you an action to take inside that new situation. That's happening spontaneously. 
much better, though, to know how to do it systematically so that we can do it anytime we are taking an action that doesn't work for us. So you said something interesting. Where does action originate and how can we know what that action is going to be? Well, frankly, we can't. But here's what we can do, which is even more powerful. We can reflect back on the action we took and we could ask, does that work for us or not? Is that an action that took me in the direction I want to go in? And if the answer is no, then to know that that is coming from a pattern in the brain, to know that that's the origins of that action, allows us to remove that pattern and then let the brain do what the brain does brilliantly. Adapt, create a new pattern, take a new action. Love that. And your the, the reflection piece is very important there. And, and my, I have this kind of terminology I use roughly in, in what I remember from the one philosophy class I took. They had said there's hard determinism, soft determinism beliefs. But I even just think that people fall into those categories more so is the hard deterministic people just don't ask the question of reflection. They don't ask if they can be better. They just get stuck in their ways and this is the way I am. And then the soft deterministic, I mean, realistically, you know, to some degree, we're always going to be in the determinism field, but there are those like yourself and myself that will ask the question, okay, why did I do that? How can I better prepare? And, you know, if, if, if you were to think about this, let's say not so lifestyle oriented, people will grasp the concept of an athlete being like, okay, I got to reflect on that play. I got to think about what were my situational cues that told me that. And people will believe that's a great learning ad adaptation skill, but we won't conceive this in life. What were the emotions that led you to, you know, not do your workout or to get stressed at work or to, you know, make a poor food choice. And for me, that reflection piece made such a difference in my diet. And this is just over the last couple of years, I stopped just getting mad at the past. And I started asking, why did it happen? And it takes the emotion out of the event. And, and I would even say, when you, when you think about this whole neurobiology of it, asking the question itself has to become a habit, right? You have to establish that. So I, I love that you address that. So let's, let's keep going down this kind of adventure that you started to discover. What, what other really unique perspectives came to, to light within this new education for you? Yeah. So, you know, we swim, Ryland, in a land of blame and shame. We swim in a society in which we have to point a finger and find out what's wrong. And typically that point finger, if we're not getting to our goals, gets pointed at ourselves. But why is that? Well, the reason for that is because nobody has taught us that it is our brain that is predetermining those decisions. So let's go back to that concept of free will. If we believe strongly in free will, then there should be no reason why we shouldn't be able to move forward. And what I kept butting up against was I couldn't move forward. I quit three businesses, one after another. I, I was just, every time I would start a business, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I would start one. I would get a little bit ways down the path and boom, I would turn tail and run. And it was honestly, it was like a door just got slammed in my face. I just could not move forward. And so I would do what I'm taught to do, blame myself, beat myself up. If any of your listeners are trying to get to a goal and they're not, don't beat yourself up. Here's the answer. Why are you not doing that? Because your pattern is not doing that period. Okay. That it, there's some deep, deep freedom in that and the ability to say, okay, the reason that I'm not taking that action is because I don't yet have a pattern in my brain to take that action that releases all of that shame and blame that we swim in. Then the next thing is, is how are we going to create that pattern? How did I stop my attitude or my pattern for quitting? How did I stop that behavior? Well, what I had to do was I had to first understand what a pattern was. So a pattern is an intertwined physical sensation, emotion, thought. When the three aspects of our being come together, it results in a particular action, behavior, or belief, okay? So identifying it that way as you're doing, you're saying, okay, well, why am I eating that? Great. That's a really good question. What, but not why as in what excuse am I using to eat it? Why as in what is my emotion that is driving me towards that food? What is my physical sensation? What's my desire? Where is that occurring in the body physiologically? Right. And then what is my thought? Oh, I want that. I need that. I'm, uh, I can't live without that. Great. That's just a thought process. All of that is driven by a pattern. As soon as we know that, then we can start to address it at that level, 
rather than beating ourselves up, making ourselves wrong and trying to do differently. Absolutely. And, and this is the term pattern is very important that people kind of depict things as patterns. And what I try to use is a very simplistic um, kind of analogy. I'm a, I, I love using analogies. It, it really sheds light on things for people to appreciate. And so for when it really comes down to it, you know, the way that your neurological system, it runs like rivers. And so if you imagine just a, a forest of rivers, you have emotions and thoughts and patterns running through that forest, that rainforest, like rivers do. And if you want to, in any way, have a new river or dam up a river and try to prevent that action, you're going to come up to resistance because it's a normal pattern. It's a normal way to flow. I, I really kind of discovered this thought concept when, you know, I was dealing with a breakup. And when you have so much emotion and just raw feelings they, they don't stop. They turn from love to hate. And then they, they're just this weird mixture of love and hate. And you just don't want to think about them. So you have to think to yourself, well, wh where do you put, cause there's this energy and emotion going to it. Well, a, you got to dam up that river, which, you know, that takes a long time and B you've got to pour that effort into other things. But one of the, the things I use for the analogy on this for individuals is to think about, you know, Rivers are very intimidating to dam up, but a beaver doesn't hesitate. You know, he, he does it one stick at a time, you know, and, and they get it done. And so that's kind of the reason why I like that analogy is because what you're talking about is establishing patterns and recognizing patterns are going to come up against resistance. Right. And so once you appreciate that's just the resistance that's normally felt, because it's currently the pattern doesn't mean it will always be there and it will get easier. So for yourself, when you started to recognize these patterns, what were your strategies to break free of it? Yeah, well, perhaps it might be easier if I give an analogy from one of my clients, because you're talking a, a lot about nutrition and about proper diets and, you know, eating the right things. So I had one client, and this shows you the power of working with your brain's patterning rather than working with having to correct an action that's not working for you. So she had this pattern in which she believed strongly that she was addicted to sugar. And she said to me, when she first started working with me, she said, Adele, if you had a magic wand and you said, I can tap and take away your love of sugar. She said, please don't tap. She said, I really need my sugar. I don't want to be away from it. And, and sure enough, she had candy everywhere, Ryland. It was hidden in all her cupboards. It was in the desk drawers. It was everywhere. If she was going to eat breakfast, it was going to be a donut. Okay, this, is, this was her lifestyle. And I said, don't worry, I'm not going to tap. I said, instead, what I'm going to give you is four steps. And I just want you to apply those four steps every single day. And it was about her cravings for sugar. It was about her belief that she was addicted to sugar. And I just had her apply these four steps. And each time she did it, she was de gently teasing apart the neural pathway in her brain, even though she didn't know that. Okay, so you have a channel in your brain that I call a pattern. She was gently teasing that channel apart. Each day I would ask her, so how's the sugar eating going? No change, no change, no change. This went on for about four weeks, which is expected. And then at the fifth week mark, I said to her, so, you know, how did it go today, the, this week? And she said, you know what? She thought about it for a moment. And she said, I went to the, now, one of the things that you need to know about this woman is she had this ha habit of going down the, the candy aisle at the grocery store. And she could never avoid the candy aisle. It was one of her big things, okay? And she would go to the grocery store sometimes just to go down that candy aisle. That's how she, much she loved that candy aisle. She said to me, Adele, she said, I went to the grocery store the other day. And she said, you're not going to believe it. I walked right past the candy aisle. She said, I didn't even think about it. And I said, that's the sign of a, re a removed pattern. It's not like you're fighting yourself anymore. It's not like you have to hang on and say, I'm not going to do that anymore. There's just, it's just literally, Ryland, you step out of one identity into another identity. You go from somebody who eats sugar to somebody who just doesn't eat sugar. And it's that night and day in black and white. It really is that powerful. Wow. That's, that's tremendous that that works so well for individuals. Have you had many people that that's worked for just whether it's yeah. that exercise or anything? 
Absolutely. Um, you know, in our in our blame and shame world where we are told that we should be able to control what we do next, we have at best, I mean, I think what's the what's the rate of success inside a diet? It's something outrageous, like long term. I think something like four percent. Have I got well, that right? Yeah. So they say nine out of ten people who tr will try to lose weight will actually gain it all back. Yeah. So there's only like one, one percent then <laughs> in their weight yeah. loss. Yeah. 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 Okay. So in my programs, when I work with people to change a behavior, we have an 87% success rate. That's wow. the difference. Yeah. It really is incredibly powerful to know how the brain is working and then to work with it rather than against it. We are taught to work against it. We are taught that we need to know what we need to do and fight ourselves to do that. Removing those patterns, you just let it go. It just literally is just like, oh. I just, I'm just somebody who doesn't do that anymore. I quit wine in the same way. I, I was terribly addicted to wine. I would have a, a bottle, a bottle and a half of red wine every single night. And do you think I could stop? Oh, like every craving in my body was moving me towards that wine bottle come five o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. Repatterning it. One day I just woke up and I went, nah, don't feel like it. Don't want it. And I haven't had a drink in two and a half years. Just, but I'm not fighting it. I'm not like I'm... I can't have a drink, right? It's just something that I just don't even think about anymore. It would be like, you know, it would be like somebody just offering me a, a glass of poison. It's like, why would I drink that? <laughs> it's just no wow. interest. Yeah. Well, that's, that's tremendous. I think that's so great because this is what, uh, you know, I know my field needs a lot of is understanding of behavior change because, um, this is, you know, we got obesity crisis in the world and, um, you, you hear 90% of the people are failing. And so, it, and I've always, recognize that there is it's more about the mind than it is about the task because you had already said the steps are obvious they're all over right and so how can we get that mind really um you know into that right routine so what do you think are some of the main mistakes that you see people make when they're trying to do something whether it's whether it's food or even just personal development what are some of the main mistakes you see um, I think probably one of the primary mistakes is this belief that you're in control. If we just drop that belief altogether, right, then we can actually start positioning our brain where it needs to be positioned. What am I doing that is not working? That's your best question. Okay, so here's the new operating instructions for anybody out there. Your job is, yes, to set a goal. We all need ambition. We all need to know where we're going. Okay. The next question though, is not, how do I get there? And the next question is, why am I not there right now? What beliefs do I have about myself, about the world, about the goal? What behaviors am I adopting? Am I procrastinating? Am I avoiding? What, um, what actions am I taking or not taking, which is preventing me from getting to that goal? All of that under every single one of those, there runs a pattern. Now your next job is to remove that pattern. Let's not worry about getting to the goal, okay? Let's just remove the pattern that is preventing you from getting to the goal. Big difference. At that point, your brain, as I said, will do what it does best and it will adapt and it will change. Now, will it change in a way that will hurt you? Absolutely not. Every fiber of our being is on our side. It wants our survival. It wants to thrive. It wants our happiness. It wants us to be in that position where everybody tells us that we should be happy and content and peaceful and all of that. It just doesn't know how to do that running on old obsolete patterns that need to be removed. Okay. Once we remove it, though, we give it an opportunity to take us in that direction, to take us in the direction of our dreams and of our goals. And if we do this correctly and use a method of subtraction, we will absolutely end up more than likely beyond that goal, even further than we dreamed was possible, because our brain is constantly trying to get us where we want to go. I love how much you uh, really flip the script on this, you know, you don't talk about the goal and, and just that whole statement, you're not in control right now. And, and I think that 
in some way, it does take the onus off the person's shame and responsibility. So you're not in as much control as you think. So you can stop blaming yourself so much. You're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at something that you're, you're it's not already a part of your identity. And, and so it takes a step backwards. And like you say, you're thinking of uh, rewiring it instead of just trying to force a machine to do something it's not made for. So I really, I, I like that, uh, that depiction because it's, definitely flips a script on things. So I want to use a bit of a, a, um, an example and, and just to hear your rough overview of how you would go about it. Cause you know, I, I deal with a lot as a trainer, I deal with a lot of people who are, you know, more resistant to training consistently. Right. So, um, they, they just develop, you know, stories and narratives that they need to be maybe in a gym or they need everything to line up and then, Oh, you know, something throws it off. And, um, or they, or they're just not good on their own. You know, some clients have had, it was like, I have to be there for them to do it. Uh, what do you think is one of the major, like kind of hardwire points that people are missing to become autonomous in, I am someone who exercises. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, Back, we're not born with patterns. As human beings, our brain is pretty much born a blank slate. Let's forget about nurture for a moment or nature for a moment. Let's just say it's all nurture, just for argument's sake. So when we enter this world, our brain very, very quickly has to piece together patterns in order to take action. So it very quickly, just every situation that we're in, it just takes pattern, just stores that away for future use. Okay. Once the brain has a pattern, it's a little bit lazy. It prefers to use that pattern than create a new pattern. And that's what you need if you are going to go to the gym every day. You need a new pattern, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So rather than, than beating yourself up, as you're saying, rather than making yourself wrong, your job is to say, okay, I've got a pattern in my brain that is not going to the gym. How does that pattern feel about going to the gym? Right. And it probably will feel burdened and angry and frustrated and <laughs> like a victim, like, well, I shouldn't have to go to the gym and I don't have time to go to the gym and all of that stuff. OK, perfect. And that's an indication of a pattern that doesn't work. You apply the four steps, you remove that pattern, and now your brain will create a pattern that will get you to exercise. OK, now it may or may not be the gym. It depends. But you will definitely be thriving and be exercising. And most likely, if if your trainer is saying go to the gym, most likely you will then go to the gym. But you'll go to the gym happily. You'll go to the gym content. You'll go to the gym because you want to go to the gym, not because you're forcing yourself to go to the gym. That's the difference. OK, all right. But what happens when the brain has these patterns that don't work? Like I said, your brain is a little bit lazy and it's also trying its best to keep you safe. And any pattern that you have today is taking an action. And to the brain, that action, not going to the gym in this case, feels safe according to the brain. It knows that action. It doesn't know the action of going to the gym, okay? All it knows is the pattern that it has. And so it tries to hold on to it. And what it will do is it will trap you inside that pattern. It will do its best to hold on to that action. There are four traps that the brain uses. Ready? Analysis, justification, catastrophizing, and rebelling. Those are the four traps that keep us taking those same old actions. They are also the very things that we are taught should lead us out of the pattern. Notice? You should be able to analyze why you need to go to the gym and that will have you go to the gym. You should be able to justify why if you don't go to the gym, you're going to have a heart attack. That should take you to the gym. You should be able, right? Okay. And those are the very things that are preventing you from getting to the gym. We have it all ass backwards, Ryland. Excuse my language. We have it all upside down. We're living in a very, very topsy-turvy world. Forget all of that analysis that the brain is trying to do. It will just bring you back to the old action of keeping you stuck. If we can remember that this is a method of subtraction, I'm not going to the gym. I have a pattern that is not taking me to the gym. How does that pattern feel? Angry, rebellious, lazy, stuck, great. Let's just remove that. 
And then let's just relax and allow our brain to do what our brain does. It will create a pattern and we will be at the gym, but willingly. Well, that's a really good explanation there, especially when you, you talked about those four uh, problems. And the one that I really look at a lot is justification. Uh, as soon as you are in a form of deliberation for an action, my statement has been, when you're trying to justify something is probably wrong. The correct action doesn't require justification because you know, it's correct. And so, and on top of that, you talk about the safety thing. And this is, this is this, um, I, you know, I look at it as an evolutionary perspective that, you know, what makes us human and evolved was finding an easier, efficient way to do things. That is what made us who we are. It's what it created the world we live in and why we're talking through screens right now. But inherently it made us lazier too, right? Because, well, what's the efficiency? What's, what's the uh, path of least resistance? And then I say, well, that creates a character that resists the path. And so you are going to fight some of this natural inclination to make it easier on yourself because these voices and these ideas are really self-preservation in the end of the day. Not to mention a great deal of our society over the last 50 to 80 years, like did not know exercise was going to be a necessity, right? It was, you know, it's put a food on the table, go to job, do your work. Like exercise is pretty new. Nutrition is pretty new. So this is a whole new bro uh, spectrum of, even though you had said when you're born, you don't have any well, you got 50, like I'm talking about some older populations for sure, 45 years of people who just didn't know they were supposed to be doing this. But I, I really love this kind of breakdown that you have. And so when you have someone trying to create this, what are some challenges for people to, uh, to, to, to try to transform that way of thinking? Like you talked about the four steps. What were the four steps again? So four steps of this. Um, first, uh, identify it as a pattern. So a pattern is an intertwined physical sensation, emotion, thought. So step one is just to identify. It's not to ask, where am I going? Why am I doing that? None of that, right? We're going to put all that aside. What am I feeling? Where am I feeling it? What one thought is going through my head? So if we use the gym example, if you don't want to go to the gym, okay, what pattern is preventing me from going to the gym? We're just going to identify that. Okay. Second step, let's flip that switch. It's not about the gym at all. It's about the pattern itself. So let me just explain what I just said. Our brain is locked inside a bony skull. Our brain has no real access to the outside world. Okay. What it goes on is electrical impulses that fly down channels. That's all that it has in there. It doesn't have a tree inside the brain. It the tree is out there, that sensory data that comes in. Our brain has to interpret that tree as a tree. It doesn't have a pattern, or sorry, it doesn't have an experience of going to the gym. It has a pattern that brings it an experience of being at the gym. Make sense? Okay, fabulous. All right, to own it like that, oh, I've got an electrical impulse flying down a channel in my brain that brings me an experience of going to the gym as being yucky. Yeah, now you're empowered. Whereas the other way, you've got to change the gym or you've got to do something to like being at the gym, right? Okay, great. So that's step two. We're going to own it as a pattern, not as an experience out there. Step three, you are going to deconstruct that pattern. You're going to pull that pattern apart. Remember I said it's a channel in your brain. You're just going to tease that pattern apart. And there's a specific way to do that. It's using observation and surrender. And then step four, you're going to allow the brain to do what the brain does and create a brand new pattern for you. And that step's really already done for you once you remove the old pattern, but we're going to kind of direct it a little bit so that it gets you in the direction of those goals. So those are the four steps. Identify, own, deconstruct, then create another one. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and so when you work with your clients, is this like more of a counseling approach? Do you see them routinely and kind of guide them through it? Um, I, I have many, many different ways that I teach these four steps. My job on this planet, I believe, is just to spread the word about this. So I have a book which offers all four of the steps for people who are real do-it-themselves. I also have an on-demand program, which has um, video lesson plans so people can use to learn the four steps. And then I have my, my guidance, so either in group or one-on-one. -on -one. So anyway, depending on the uh, the individual, people need different levels of, 
of support. Absolutely. Yeah. That's definitely how it works with people, right? It just depends on uh, the individual, but depends on the patterns, <laughs> depends on the patterns. Absolutely. You might need more support. Maybe you just need that overhead view. But uh, so with, with this, what do you find? And I, I, I would uh, perceive like step three might be one of the biggest resistance or the hardest, more technical, like you'd said, more details come out. Um, what are some other challenges that you really find with this that people end up resistant to? Yeah, those traps can be huge. Um, they can really get, keep us stuck inside of beliefs about identity. So how I work this whole thing is part theory, part experience. And the brain needs theory. It won't do what you tell it to do unless you tell it why it needs to do that. Okay, So it's really important that it understands why you are suggesting to do a particular thing. But at the same time, that those insights are rather cheap, really. I mean, you know, it's great. Like, Ryland, I'm sure you have people out there who you work with and you say, look, it's really important that you go to the gym. And they go, yeah, absolutely, it is. And then you say, well, you want to go? No, <laughs> right? <laughs> because that theory is insight doesn't really drive any change in action. So we need the experience first. So that's why when I work with somebody, we, we slow it down when we do one step a week. So everybody works on one step for a full week before they get the next step. And we just rebuild that pattern in the brain because, as you said earlier, you need a pattern to take a, an action, right? And you have to create that habit first before you can even begin. Did that answer your question? I feel like I went a bit off track. But... No, 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 that did. That did. Because <laughs> okay. it's, like you had said, um, well, especially when you talked about experience and just the levels of how you need the theory and the experience. And because again, it, and people are just, you know, you got visual learners, you got, you know, uh, just a whole different level of personalities. But I have always believed that the why supports the what and the how. And so like, cause it, it's so important and you feel more motivated. It's like, you know, when I try to convince someone to eat, you know, the appropriate amount of protein, like, Oh my goodness, that's so much. Why? And I show them all the evidence and they're like, Oh, okay. That makes sense. But then they still will be resistant and they'll still say, yeah, but I don't really like that stuff. And it's like, well, let's just try it for a bit. And then, you know, I, if my sister, I, she was very resistant to it. Two months later, she's like, I can't believe how much I don't crave anything. Like, you know, the weight loss goals aside, it's all gone. And so, so many people needed that level of experience to come into it and they needed to trust the system, but you gave them some why you gave them the, how they tried the, what, and then they got the experience of the whole thing and the purpose. And it's very potent. So I love those levels of description. And you also really talked about one of the big things and, and you came back to it a couple of times in just identity. Like this is what people are not even aware that that's what is like the real core thing here. Right. Yeah. You're talking about your decisions before your decisions. This is a part of your identity and your the way your whole talk you're talking about it is recognize your identity. Let's try to say that doesn't have to be your identity. And then let's create a new identity. And you do it at such a very, you know, very deep level. I see this very effective for that exact reason. You just, people have to accept that. I remember when I started to actually ask myself that same question with some of my behavior changes. And it was just like, I don't have to be this person. Like, why do I keep doing this? And it was because it was a pattern. It was a habit. It was a routine. It's like, but I don't want to still be this person because it causes me problems. So I think that's very, very awesome that you, you have this whole approach. And, you know, I was going to ask you about the traditional smart goals. And, you know, for those who don't know, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, timely, this, this throws it all to the side, right? Because, you know, you might have, there's, there's nothing wrong with having a place that you want to be, but it's not where the actual mechanics of it work. Is that, is that kind of how you believe? Yeah, absolutely. I, I always say smart goals are stupid <laughs> in that they limit our capacity for change, right? If we set a goal, if we actually are going to achieve that goal, well, well, what happens for most people, if you achieve a goal that you set, you're going to be unhappy. Okay, now there's a reason for that. <laughs> and let me just explain why that is the case, because I'm sure most people have seen that happen. You set a goal, you get there and you go, well, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Right. And that's because the goal is being sent by a pattern box that is now obsolete. 
So let me explain again. Remember I said that you created those patterns when you were little and those patterns will continue to take those actions until you change those actions. Well, when we were little, is it probably true that you weren't good enough at some of the things you tried, right? But regardless, even though you weren't good enough, your brain stored that pattern and continues to use that action. So that pattern is now obsolete. It's that obsolete pattern that sets that goal. It's that pattern that says, Ryland, you're not good enough. But if you get here, you will be, <laughs> okay? But that, that box is already obsolete and is already setting a goal that once you get there, you're not going to be happy because it doesn't actually fix the problem. It didn't change the initial pattern. So when I say smart goals are stupid, here's what I mean. Yes, you need to set a goal, but don't make it specific and measurable. Don't make it, don't, don't make it timely. Don't stick yourself into a little box anymore. Instead, say, okay, that's my ambition. That's where I want to be. What's preventing me from getting there? Now, what's going to happen? You're going to remove the pattern that is not taking the action to get you to that goal. Your brain will then create a brand new pattern and you will take a step. Will you take a step directly in the direction of that goal? Likely not. You're going to take a step, but it'll be a little bit to the left. Okay. And then you're going to remove the pattern again that prevents you from taking the next step and going to take another step, this time a little to the right of that goal. And then you're going to remove the pattern again. Your brain will create a new one and take another step. You're going to create another step. And before you know it, you are well past that goal and you're in a space and you go, wow, I absolutely love myself. I love where I am. I love what I've accomplished. Right? And it won't be based in a fix. It will, base, it will be based in and optimal patterns that have driven optimal actions. That's the difference. I really appreciate the whole conversation of when people get the end of their goal and find that there's not like happiness there. That is so valuable that people have to appreciate like my, and, and I say at the end of every single podcast is that it is not the pursuit of happiness. It's a happiness within the pursuit. And what you're talking from, from my interpretation of that is like, you're already in a box that you're saying, I'm not happy. And that person in this box is making a goal. You get there. You're still that person. Like you're still not happy with something. And so if you can say, Hey, well, I, have this, this, this whole objective, you know, it doesn't have to be a goal that's going to make me a better person that's happier, but it's just the person that I am that sets this position up. Right. And in like, whether it's today or me five years from now, I'll still be happy now as I am later, but I am the person that sets, you know, you know, destinations I, and goals in some way, but my happiness isn't essentially going to be any different, right? I'm not trying to find a new version of myself. And that's where my happiness is because if that's where you think it's going to be, you're going to live a very unhappy life. You're always going to wait for happiness to come around the corner. It, it dawned on me one day when I was training for, um, for a photo shoot and, and, you know, I was super dialed in. I was well-disciplined. Everything was going good with the diet and felt good about my physique. I was feeling good, but I was also like, in this kind of narrative, and this is the thought pattern of can't wait for this to be over. And a thought came over me and, and, and it was very interesting where it was like, but why, why are you not stoked about life right now? You're enjoying all of it. You're enjoying, um, I was in school. I was killing in school. I was having great nutrition. I wasn't starving. I had great workouts and I'm in the best physique. How is this not your best? And it completely opened my eyes. I still remember that day. And, uh, and I, I just, I, that was the day I recognized that when I'm pursuing something is my happiness, that is the best version of me. And so at the end of that pursuit has less happiness in store. If that's where my uh, identity has to achieve happiness. Right. And so I, I love that whole discussion because it's very important that people recognize even their narration around where your happiness exists, right? Because, you know, happiness is a state in a perception. It is not an end goal, right? So I, I really value that a lot. Now with when you're, um, what do you, what do you really try to help people with as far as establishing, because I'm trying to use this terminology for goals and like, you know, how do you utilize that for personal development? What kind of like terminology do you use? How do you help people set up this whole perspective? Yeah. Um, so people come to me for all sorts of things. I mean, you know, weight loss is one, but 
I don't typically deal in that area. I deal more with emotional eating or things along that line. Um, but people come to me because their relationships are off, they have conflict in their relationships, their careers are not working well. There's always something that they know internally is not working for them. I like to say, if you're suffering, it is because you have a pattern that is causing that suffering. That's the only reason that we suffer. And if we remove that pattern and upgrade that pattern, that suffering goes away. Right. So the first job is to, I, you know, I always start like this in life. There are problems. People look at me like, what? What, what do you mean? <laughs> they, they either say, yeah, you're right. Or, well, it shouldn't be that way. And I say, no, no. If you if you look at life as just a series of problems, one after another, after another, and know that the problem is the result of a pattern in your brain that is no longer working then you can face any problem that you have in life. It's like, oh, okay, I got a problem. Yay, that tells me I have an unworkable pattern. I get to remove that, and now the problem will go away. So that's the way I work with people. It's like, sure, what goals do you have? And then what's preventing you from getting to those goals? Let's remove those patterns, and let's just see what happens next. And they delight in what happens next because your brain is absolutely brilliant. And you really hit on this narrative of, you know, well, how you change your narrative, right? How you change your perception. Um, I heard someone say this recently on my podcast, and he had said it's the story that people are telling themselves. And he had a great example of two brothers, both live in the same household, had an alcoholic father. One uh, brother ends up being very successful. The other turns into an alcoholic. And when you ask them both, why did they turn out the way they did? They will both say, I had an alcoholic father. Look how I grew up. What other choice did I have? Both of them had the same upbringing and both of them can go in the uh, opposite directions because it's either what is happening to me or this is happening. What can I do? And when you would, you know, that whole statement there is so powerful and potent because that right there. And I said, this as a start is that this recognizing pattern of you have a problem that's not a problem necessarily. That's a good thing that you can optimize your life in a better way. You know, flipping the script, creating positive out of the negative is, is really that in itself is a neurological habit that you want to establish. So I think that's great that you're empowering people this way. What other uh, great tips do you have for individuals on personal development? Oh, be gentle with yourself. <laughs> you know, we don't try. I mean, you know, don't beat yourself up. If you beat yourself up, it's a pattern that's beating you up. So don't beat yourself up about that. Right. But do try and be gentle with yourself. Uh, as I said at the, initially, it really took me a long, long time to realize that it wasn't me to realize that we were following the wrong operating instructions that I had been taught incorrectly how to achieve my goals. And in that, I was beating myself up terribly. So to be able to step back and go, okay, well, hang on a minute. My brain is wired a particular way. That doesn't make that me. That just means that I have a wire in my brain that needs to be changed and that you can change it. Um, is so empowering. It's, it's just, it's the difference. It's night and day, honestly. You know, I mean, I just got off a call with one client and he was beating himself up because he said, I'm irresponsible around money. And I said, well, hang on a minute. I said, you have a pattern that was irresponsible around money and maybe still is. That pattern still may exist in your brain, but that doesn't define you. That is just a pattern. And now you have the tool in your pocket to change that pattern. So who are you going to be in the future? Well, his relief was incredible. It was like, oh, yeah, it's that simple. I don't have to worry about how to fix it. I just have to apply the tool and it will fix itself. That's the way the brain is wired. And that's the way we need to be. So number one, be gentle. If anybody asks you why you did that, because my pattern made me do it. That's it. <laughs> There's nothing to fix. There's nothing broken. Yeah. It, and it, it, it is so helpful to get out of the pattern to forgive it. And uh, for myself, 
that was huge for me and like kind of binge eating habits. And, and it's been like, seriously, over just over the last couple of years, I could get in great shape, but then it would fall into more of a yo-yo cycle myself, uh, to what I could acceptably get away with as a trainer. But I would eat ridiculous amounts of food that people would be shocked that a trainer eats. And it was a pattern. It was this, it was very much a part of that. I prefer to refer to it as the, the pendulum of discipline and, and not giving a shit because people either try really hard or they just give up. Right. And that, well, like you say, is a pattern. Yeah, if I can add to that, Ryland, through willpower and control, you will be able to maintain a particular routine for a certain amount of time. But it is a lot of effort, right? Because you're constantly fighting those patterns. And that's why we make those same mistakes over and over and over again. That's why diets don't work, because we fight ourselves, we fight ourselves, and we can do it. We can maintain that consistency for a little while. But can you maintain it forever and ever? Most people know, like some people can, because they have a strong pattern for commitment already. But if you don't, it's, it's not because there's anything wrong with you. It's just simply because patterns do what patterns do and they just take actions. And that's all that happens. Absolutely. And that's why you have nine out of 10 people who don't sustain it. And exactly. It's a big part of the problem. And, you know, this is where I try to coach a lot of my clients on like showing them, like I'll show them my style of eating. I'm showing them some habits, but it still has to fit some of their habits and patterns to make sure that they're empowered by their choice. And it is their choice to make these things. And like you say, discipline and, and willpower. The, the reason why I, I call it a pendulum is because if you imagine a real heavy mace or pendulum that you're holding with your grip and yeah, you can hold it for a while until your grip gets tired. And then you let go for a second, it's going to swing the other way that you're holding it from and you're not going to be able to grab it. It's going to swing. And then come back and hit you in the head. (laughs) Exactly. Well, and and that's the exact whole concept, right? It's like people will really care and then they just, I can't hold it. So it swings the other way and they do what they don't want to do. Then they try to pull back and got to make up for it. So they pull back harder, right? It's like, oh man, I overate so much over Christmas. I'm just not going to eat for two days. And so this is like that patterning behavior. And I fell into it many times. This is where bulimia comes in. This is where anorexia comes from. But bulimia for sure is just this, absolute overcompensation for over restriction. And this is where, like, when I started to ask myself, it was just simply like, why am I doing this? In the, in, especially if you're in the midst of doing what you would see as a mistake as overeating, or maybe you're skipping a workout, just ask yourself that question. Why? Like start to pick apart what's going on because there's subconscious levels here that there, there's probably something in your environment that's stressing you out. There's probably something that's making you tired. There's probably something that made you emotional before you went in to go to eat food or decide not to work out. When you start to ask these questions, why it's no different than I had said, when an athlete's on the field, he needs to see certain cues. He sees certain body language. And we all know that that makes sense why he would respond faster. Well, you can do this in your own environment every single day for a habit that you want to improve and for a lifestyle that you want to live more in control of, but you have to ask yourself and forgive yourself. Hey, I got it wrong, but why did I get it wrong? But what was it about my whole nature that, that was the problem? Because if previously yours was just, hate. that's all it was. I would just, man, I hate that. That sucks. And you just, only thing you left behind there was emotion and regret. There was no questions there that you, if you don't ask why a mistake happened, it gets left as a mistake. Otherwise, if you ask yourself, what was the mistake about it is officially a lesson it is officially where you can learn from. So I totally value that. I think that is such a valuable point for anyone who just wants to improve themselves in any way, forgive the mistake first, and then ask yourself why. And that's how you, you move forward. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would just say, instead of asking why, cause your brain will answer that question. Better question is what, what pattern just had me take that action or not take that action. That's right. a much better question. Yeah. 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 That's a good way to look at it for sure. If you're going on the mm-hmm. pattern, like what is the routine? What is, what is connecting here? What's that feeling? And especially when you talk about the emotions and the feelings, like uh, it, it's very important that we recognize our emotions. I had another guest on here who also works with people for emotional eating. And that was her, her, her main thing was start to recognize the emotions 
and sit with them. Like just to, if you can be within that, that makes such a difference. I, I love all of this. And I think this is very helpful for a lot of the listeners. Um, what I'd love to know is you're, you're going down this rabbit hole of behavior change. What's, what's in the pipeline for you? What are you really excited about your more most recent ambition in this? Um, well, when COVID hit, I had to move everything from live events to online. So I now have, um, what I call the pattern maker hub available. Um, yeah, my next ambition is I'm going to fill that hump with as many people as need this technique and spread it as far and wide as possible. That's wonderful. I think this is what people need, especially I know in my discipline, it uh, doesn't matter what you know about training and nutrition these days. A lot of the evidence is there. We can use most of it for fundamentally most of the problems, but people can't apply it. And the, the reason they can't apply it is this, the, the patterning of their, uh, their whole concepts. And because, and, and that's where, you know, tr- the people you're going to see for the information don't have it. Right. Yeah. You know, it was, it was kind of funny how the rabbit hole for me went on because I was a chubby kid when I was younger and I wanted to get out of that. So I did, de- you know, determined, okay, training was the way. Then I recognized, wow, I'm obsessed about food. So I got my nutrition degree. Wait a minute. If you don't make the right decision on either of those, none of it matters. <laughs> so psychology is like the real core of everything. And so I, I love that people are out there like yourself trying to make that huge impact. I think that's awesome. Why don't you let uh, the listeners know more about where they can find out all your information. You talked about the book and everything else that they can find out about you. Yeah. So my, my website is probably the best place to go adelspragan.com. So that's two G's. Um, and there they can get a free copy of my book. All I ask is people pay for shipping. There's a link there to order a book. There's also, you can get 30 days free in the Pattern Maker Hub. So check out the training for nothing. And there's lots of free training there as well. So, yeah. Awesome. I, well, I can tell you, I'll be definitely referring my clients and people I know that need this support for sure. I think it's quite helpful. And I, and I love the whole depiction. I think this is the right track for a lot of people. I'll probably definitely get your book myself and dive into some of this stuff. I think this is great. Thank you so much for this conversation today. Oh, you're so welcome, Ryland. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much, Adele. I really enjoyed that conversation thoroughly because this is exactly what I want to understand myself. Why do we not do the things that we want to set out to do? And I think she's really peeling back the right questions. This is very similar to the conversation with Alicia, where it's more about why are we doing what we're doing or ask the behaviors, what, what is the behavior that's leading to this in the neurobiology? And so I know I'm going to get her book. I encourage you to dive into that stuff and check out her website. Cause I think there's something really important there and that message needs to be spread. So I hope this whole conversation helped you out a lot. Remember to like subscribe and share this. If you can with someone who also struggles with behavior change, I think that's what I really hope the most with this whole podcast same with Adele is to spread the message. So please spread this exact podcast to someone who, you know, struggles with behavior change. And other than that, as I had mentioned in this very same episode, don't forget, it's not about the pursuit of happiness. It's about the happiness within the pursuit.